It says waiting for me. I'm hoping this is live. Starting preview. It says it's coming. Okay. Hopefully this is live. Are we live? Go live. This is strange. <laughs> I am having some very strange technical issues right now, and I'm not quite sure if things are connecting or not. So let me keep checking. Let's see, it says connecting to YouTube. Let's just do a retry. I'm going to keep trying. Okay, now it says we're live. I'm hoping this time now everything is going to be connected and it looks like we're good. <laughs> Sorry for the delay. Once again, you know, I'm a one-woman show and so things either work or they don't work and, and sometimes things get a little bit crazy when I try to do this. So let me check here to see if we, if we now say we're live. I'm looking at a lot of stop and start. Yes, I see that. Okay, good. I, looks like we're good because I'm seeing some replays here. Okay, looks good here. Does it sound good? Everybody, does it sound good? I'm looking at the comments on a different screen. So if I disappear for a second, it's because I'm trying to read the chat and, and get an idea of whether or not everything is working. Are we good, guys? Uh, let's see. It's all good now. Yeah, doing great. Okay, wonderful. I will take that as a yes, and thank goodness. Whew, it's been a very interesting morning. Um, lots of technical issues, but we're here. And I'm very excited to be able to show you this new course. This is now the second of the space weather phenomena in this series of space weather phenomena that we're doing. I'm going to be going through, I, I, uh, well, let me start over. The last, the very first uh, topic in this space weather uh, phenomenon series were coronal mass ejections. If you haven't seen them, all of those courses are on YouTube, so you can go back and look. Just search for Q&A. I will eventually make a, a separate like channel that just just as for those uh, those courses for you so you'll it'll be easier for you to find them but if you haven't taken any of the courses on coronal mass ejections which are also called solar storms i strongly uh urge you to do that uh take them at your leisure and you know there's they're not really tough they're just long uh, but they tell you all sorts of things about solar storms and you're going to need a little bit of that information to, to uh, better absorb what i'm going to talk about today because you'll see some of that stuff being repeated um, but it's not critical. I mean, you don't don't worry. If you don't know what coronal mass ejections are, or you haven't seen my courses on those subjects yet, don't worry too much. It's it's not that big a deal. Um, but please, yes, go back and get them. Now, this is going to be the first of several courses on solar flares. Uh, I had a choice when I was putting this course together. I had a choice to either talk about the phenomena and go into a bunch of eye candy and, you know, play a bunch of flare movies. But I started thinking about it and I said, you know, that's already been done. I mean, everybody does that, right? Even NASA's press releases, it's just a bunch of eye candy. And okay, yeah, that's great. But really, this is a space weather for people who use it. You know, what? it's beautiful to look at this stuff and say, uh, it's pretty, but what does it mean for my daily life? So I decided for this first course to take a slightly different tack, and that's why it says, as the sun screams, solar flares, and radio bursts. Because really what I'm going to do in this course is I'm going to talk about a little bit about flares and about their dynamics, but not too much. I'm going to jump really into the aspect of flares that really is why the sun is screaming. What, make, what is it about flares that makes the sun scream at Earth or at any other planet in, in the solar system? And so we'll focus a, a quite a bit on the more actionable, if I can use that term, uh, aspect of solar flares, because this is really what people who use space weather and need it for their daily lives, this is the part of the solar flare that really matters to them. So we're going to kind of ground ourselves in that first, and then probably the next course, uh, I'll go into more of the flare dynamics and some of the prettier pictures so that we can put the whole you know, idea together as a big coherent thing, because you'll already know about what parts of the flare scream and why, and how that evolves over time. And then you'll be able to put it together with the pretty pictures that you see, and have a, bit, a more intimate understanding of what's going on. So with that, I want to kind of thank all of my patrons. See, let me stand on this side, sorry. I always get right and left mixed up because it's a, it's a mirror in my, in my monitor. 
So I want to thank all of my Patreon supporters. You can see uh, my steering committee, Eric Johansson. Also, tomorrow, um, whoops, let me, I guess it's over here. Uh, Jerry Ryan, uh, Lourdes, Greg, Notani, Keith, Michael, John, and Mario. Thank you so much. You guys are on my steering committee. These are the people who are helping steer the ship, and they are helping really help me build, help, they're helping me build the types of courses that we want to see. They're helping me steer what direction we're going to take for space weather broadcasting as I move on to Millersville uh, University and start tr teaching some of these, these concepts to uh, broadcasters, to news broadcasters. And then, of course, all of these people here, uh, my mini course patrons, thank you so much. I, I rely on you for the daily dialogue uh, regarding what course you know, suggestions we, we need to have for, for the mini courses coming up uh, and the types of questions I need to make sure I can answer. Uh, you guys have been just so fantastic and uh, really have helped and prod, us, prod me along in terms of creating the, you know, each chart and each, each uh, bit of content that I show and really in what order I end up doing it. So thank you so much. You guys are just wonderful supporters. And just to let you know, everybody, uh, all of you, whether you're on Patreon or not, these courses that you're looking at are really the baseline for what is going to be a university level, a graduate certificate program actually, at Millersville University, of which I'm going to be one of like four professors. And I'm going to be teaching at least two courses on space weather. And this material is exactly the material I'm going to be presenting. Uh, things will be changed a bit, you know, as, as I kind of tailor it toward uh, the, the news media and the people that actually are going to be on broadcast TV. But nonetheless, you literally are getting uh, the same kind of content that you would be getting at Millersville. And, and so I appreciate that because you guys are kind of being the guinea pigs. You're letting me develop this stuff as we go on. And uh, if I stumble and trip over myself a few times, well, <laughs> that just kind of comes with the territory. But nonetheless, I appreciate you guys, all of you, whether you're on Patreon or not, uh, for just you know, sticking with me and, and uh, allowing me to, to find the best way to communicate this kind of stuff to you. Because it's really things, these are really subjects that we can understand. And it doesn't, you don't have to have a PhD in physics to do it. You know, yeah, of course you can, but you know, you don't have to. And uh, because this weather is becoming so important in our daily lives, um, it's, it's more and more critical that we all learn what space weather is and how it affects us. So with that, uh, introduction. I'm going to give you a slight review, and I'll probably stand here in the middle. Uh, basically, there are four types of solar phenomena that affect Earth, and so this is just a little bit of a review to kind of get us, you know, set, uh, kind of get us in the mood, I guess. Uh, and I'll just be talking about one kind today, and that's going to be the, the solar flare. Now, you can see that up here, I believe, if I'm pointing the right way. Yes, okay. So there's the solar flare. And then we'll be talking about this kind of, of phenomena today. But that's not the only thing. This, this is the kind of when the sun screams at us and it causes radio blackouts and, and uh, all sorts of other communications issues mainly. Uh, but there are other things that can be launched along with it, like a coronal mass ejection. Uh, this is the solar storms. This is the topic of the first set of, of uh, space weather phenomena courses I gave. And we went over these in very great detail, all the way from sun to mud, uh, so to speak. And we will be doing the same thing with solar flares because there are Earth impacts that we need to be talking about. Now, both coronal mass ejections or solar storms and solar flares can create radiation storms, which you see here, if I get my thing right. Yeah, radiation storms. It's mainly the, the stuff at high and low latitudes, uh, not, not the, the, that big thing in the middle right there. That's actually a solar flare um, effect but the stuff at high and low latitudes, that's radiation storms. And those can be driven by both solar flares and coronal mass ejections. And create they, they create their own unique kind of issue. And so I will be going over them in a different course um, once we get through solar flares. That will be probably the third thing we talk about. And then lastly, we have coronal holes. Now, coronal holes themselves aren't the problem, but coronal holes, uh, yeah, coronal holes actually drive the fast solar wind. And anybody who's been in a boat and drives through a, a, you know, let's say, really calm water on a lake, 
you know that as that boat plows through that water, it's driving waves kind of in front of it. It's making that water move kind of out of its way. And it's the same kind of thing with this, with the fast solar wind. You get fast wind that's driving against slow solar wind, and it creates the waves, and it creates kind of a compression. And that actually ends up acting a lot like what solar storms do when they hit Earth. Um, it, it's, it's just a big impact against Earth, and if it's got the right kind of magnetic field configuration, it can drive big solar storms. So basically, these are the four types of phenomena that really affect Earth, and today, it's all about solar flares. Okay, so our complex star, let's talk about our complex star that's always changing. You have to realize, of course, that, and again, this is part of the review, always think about our star as something that is constantly in motion. Uh, I did a, a course called Sunspots and Telescopes, and I think I went over a bit about uh, how our sun is kind of like a lava lamp. And the dynamics are really almost like roiling water for the most part. And because of those dynamics, uh, there, it, it really, um, there's just so many different ways that the sun can let off energy. Now, you can let it off as electromagnetic radiation from x-rays to radio waves, and that is, whoops, let me stand on this side, and that is what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, but we also have things like solar wind and plasma uh, with uh, magnetic fields that are driven out. We can also have, uh, yeah, you saw the solar flares, that's part of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. Uh, we have solar energetic particles, those are also called solar radiation storms that we just talked about a second ago. And then, of course, the coronal mass ejections, which are considered solar storms. And with all of this stuff, it's just impossible to just kind of put a telescope up and look at the sun in, let's say, one wavelength, one color, and expect that we're going to see everything that the sun dishes out. So we have to take that sun and really peel it like an onion, and it's because it's got layers. And if I can figure out where to stand, so I can get out of the way, then maybe you can see, if I stand far enough over this way, maybe you can see what I'm talking about. Um, all of these pictures here of the sun are of different wavelengths of the sun, but they're all taken at the same time. Now the first picture, which I'll step over for just a second so you can see it. See, this is the white light picture, and you can actually see sunspots. You see the little sunspots over here? That's what we see on the ground. With our, with our eyes, that's just white light. But as we go up higher in, in energy, we're going up higher in temperature, we're getting a little bit higher in the sun's atmosphere, we're beginning to see a different layer of that onion. And when we go up to a little bit higher, you can start seeing all the bright regions. Some of them surround sunspots. These are the plage and bright region areas, and they actually are what create solar flux. Now if I step over here, and we go even higher, now we're gonna get into the solar atmosphere, or almost, this is a transition region, and that's where you start seeing coronal mass ejections, the big solar storms that begin to lift off. Once again, yet another layer of this onion. And then you go a little bit higher, and you see the solar atmosphere and the purple sun. That's 211 angstroms. That's even a little bit higher. So now we're getting into the corona, where you're beginning to actually see the solar wind begin to lift off of the sun. Believe it or not, all of these pictures are taken essentially at the same time, but you'd never realize it by looking at them. And as you go a little bit higher you, in the yellow sun, you begin to see a uh, magnetic field beginning to, to really sh take shape. This is, the, this is the wavelength that we use to see blast waves from the sun. And if we really want to see how something follows with the magnetic field, then that, this is the wavelength we use, 171 angstroms. And I'll show you a, a movie of the flare with that, with that wavelength so you can see what I'm talking about. And then you go even higher to the blue sun, and that is 131 angstroms, and that's where we start really seeing those active regions pop out. So oftentimes we will look at flares and active regions with the blue sun because we want to see exactly what's going on in those very bright loops, and I'll show you some images of those later. But really, it's the whole reason why we end up having to have so many views of the sun. I mean, <laughs> we, just can't, we just can't see every layer of the onion you know, with one telescope or in one wavelength. So that's why we have all these different colors. It's not that scientists really want to, you know, not like we're kaleidoscopic or we just, you know, want to go back to the 60s with all the cool colors and groovy stuff. <laughs> Although that's pretty cool too. Um, but really, and I know I keep using lava lamp and other analogies, so and I'm wearing a bohemian shirt, so I imagine this is, you know, what can I say? Let me switch my mic here. Um, but nonetheless, as, as much of a fan of the 60s as I happen to be, um, 
it's not why we choose all these colors. We choose these colors so that we can very readily look at them and look at a picture and know, even if it's not labeled, what wavelength it is. And so we know what layer of the onion that we're looking at. And unfortunately, the sun is, I, I wish it were that visible all the time. I mean, that, that every, every layer of the sun were visible. But when we get down into the really internal part of the sun and the radiative zone and stuff, man, we can't see. There's a lot of parts of the sun that are still opaque to us, and so we can't really probe it all that well. And that's part of why we don't know the sun's dynamics more than just what little we know. But here to remind you that some of the phenomena that we're looking at today are going to be very different than, um, uh-oh, hang on. Is my mic screwing up? Let me hear. Hold on, guys. Oh no. Okay. I just saw some weird spikes going on in this in the audio and I can't hear otherwise. So I am I'm having trouble with that was one of the technical problems I was having today. So my mic is kind of losing it. I think I've got a short. So I'll I'll slowly check the the chat to see whether or not my mic goes out, but that's one of the things that's kind of running in the back of my mind right now is oh god, did my mic go? So if you see me freak out like this a couple of times, um my apologies. Anyway, getting back to the solar phenomena, one of the things I want to make sure that I keep clear uh, for you all is that when we're looking at solar flares, that's one type of, of uh, phenomena that occurs on the sun, but it is not the same as a coronal mass ejection. And today we're going to be talking a lot about coronal mass ejections as well as solar flares because you will see in the standard model of solar flares that they're, I don't want to say inexorably linked, because that will upset quite a few of my colleagues, but they are very often seen together. And unfortunately, that drives a huge issue uh, in the public eye, because people have a tendency to say, oh, a solar flare, okay, that's coming toward Earth, and that's going to hit Earth and cause aurora. No. The solar flare is when the sun is screaming, and that causes communication issues, radio blackouts, GPS dropouts, things like that, but it will not cause aurora. That's the coronal mass ejection that comes days later. So there's a fundamental disconnect, and I have to be very careful. So you'll see me kind of dance around a little bit today, um, simply because I gotta, I've got to make sure that I make enough distinction between the two that we don't try to just connect them together. That's one thing I've really got to fight to make sure doesn't happen. So this is another reason why I'm bringing this chart in, which is about solar phenomena. Let's see if I can stand on the correct side here. Yeah, I'll stand on this side for a second and talk a little bit about the quiet wind. Okay, the quiet, the quiet sun, this is the solar wind, this is when really nothing's happening, kind of like we have now on the sun, near so, so near solar minimum. Uh, you're basically just dealing with fast and slow solar wind streams, and so just like that boat driving through the water, uh, you'll get fast wind slamming into slow wind, and then you'll cause, you know, a wave that then can hit Earth, and then that will actually, you know, act a little bit like a solar storm, and, or it can be a solar storm. And, um, and cause disturbances for us. Sometimes they can be strong enough that they even drive shock waves in space uh, right around where Earth is. And, um, you know, and, and it, can, it can be pretty, pretty serious, but right about now it's not too much. We're, we're getting pretty weak solar storm or solar, solar wind streams. But that's pretty much all there is for a, a quiet sun. Now for an active sun, we have solar flares and coronal mass ejections. And again, I am going to spell this out because it's very important. Solar flares, which we're going to talk about more today, release x-rays and all sorts of types of radio bursts, right? Microwave energy, we're going to go into all that. We, they release solar energetic particles. Uh, they're mainly protons and electrons. They, they travel, and all this stuff travels nearly at the speed of light or at the speed of light. Now, the radio bursts that we're going to talk about today, they're all at the speed of light, right? So they take eight minutes to get to Earth. So as soon as it happens on the sun, eight minutes later, we're seeing it. So basically the same time we see it with, a, with you know, our telescopes, we're hearing it screaming because it's screaming in electromagnetic light that also travels at the speed of light. It's the same kind of light we see with our eyes, it's just a different frequency. Now, coronal mass ejections on the other hand, these are massive amounts of solar plasma with enhanced magnetic fields and they drive strong shock waves in space, but they're not moving anything close to the speed of light. Okay. They're only going about 15,000 kilometers a second, which I know is still fast, but they take days to get to Earth, typically. 
I think the fastest one was 17 hours, and it was like over 3,000 kilometers a second. And these cause the geomagnetic storms. These are the ones that cause the aurora. These are the ones that disrupt the, the Earth's night side for days upon days upon days. These are the ones that, that can cause real long-lasting damage. They cause the, the geomagnetic in, geomagnetically induced currents that upset the power grids. Power companies don't really care about solar flares. They couldn't care. Satellite operators, however, they care about solar flares as much as they care about geomagnetic storms, sometimes maybe more, depending upon what orbit they're in. So, you know, we have to keep them separate because if we lump them all together, we're going to confuse a lot of people. And that's something I continue to fight to this day. So let me play. Oh, is it, do I not have it? Oh, there we go. Here's a solar flare for you. Are you going to play? Here we go. And wait for it. <laughs> there it is. That's a beautiful, that's, that's an X-class solar flare, and you're seeing it in uh, 131 ang angstroms. So it, you see a lot of the, the, um, the gorgeous X-ray. Well, in this case, it's just uh, extreme ultraviolet. But you see where the loops are, and you see just the, the strong intensity of it. Now, if I go here and play a coronal mass ejection, this is different. So there's the surface of the sun. You can see that big coronal loop coming, or that loop coming out like that. That continues to be ejected out into space. And if you look at the other side of the picture, once it ref uh, moves again, there you go, you'll see it coming out into space. Now we're looking at a coronagraph view of it. And as that big massive thing, see how slow it's moving? That massive thing moves out into space like that. It maintains that shape. And I'll stop the movie so you can see that there. So it maintains that loop shape even as it moves out. Now this coronagraph is showing this solar storm, the CME, um, coming out to 15 sun lengths out. So it's 30 solar radii. I mean, that's quite a bit. So it tells you how massive these things are. This is, this is huge. By the time it reaches Earth, it's a, it, it can be as wide as a quarter of the distance from the sun to the Earth. That's how wide these things can be. And, and so this is why they cause disruptions for days upon days upon days. But they also take days to get to Earth. It's not like a solar flare. So please keep all of this in mind as we continue moving on and we end up talking about solar flares and radio bursts. And even though they're connected to, to coronal mass ejections, it's not the same thing. So let's talk a little bit about sunspots and why they form. So sunspots, as we get back to the sun itself, sunspots really are, are well, if, if you look at them, um, if you, let's talk, well, let me start it this way. If we talk about the sun itself being kind of like that lava lamp, we can look, almost look at it like it's a pot of boiling water, right? And if you see other, around the edges of this image, see all the light gray stuff? See how it looks like there's a bunch of bubbles? Well, all those bubbles, think of those bubbles as like bubbles of boiling water, okay? And that's what we're, um, that's really what we're talking about. And all of those bubbles, in order for the sun to emit light and let light out, it actually has to boil like this. It has to bubble. So all of that light stuff that you see all around the edges of these bubbles is where the light is being radiated out. But if you block that, well, suddenly you're no longer able to, to emit light, right? You're blocking the boiling of the water. You're not letting it come up to the surface. Well, that's kind of what sunspots are, to be honest. If you imagine in that pot of boiling water, let's say, a submarine, Okay, and that submarine is typically down underneath the surface, kind of down underground, and then it, it begins to rise up to the surface. A periscope up, it pops through the surface of the water, and it, what happens? Well, all those bubbles in that area are displaced, right? They're not there anymore. They're moved over. Well, that's, let me see if I can, that's what that umbra, that's what that dark circle is. That is the submarine popping up through the surface of the water, and it's pushing away all those bubbles so that you don't get any light emitted. So now it's a big, dark, black thing. Now, what's this lighter ring around the edge, what we call the penumbra? That's really kind of where the submarine hasn't quite reached the surface. Like if you've ever looked at ocean waves, right, and you see a submarine in the water, you look down from, let's say, an aerial view, and you can see the part of the submarine that's pierced the water, and it's the, the, the most obvious part. But then you can sometimes see that shadow of the rest of the sub under the water, because it's really close to the surface, so you kind of get a, a, a look at it. But it's kind of murky. You can't really tell. But it does change the color of the water. Same thing here. That's what that penumbra is. 
That is the part of this submarine, this magnetic submarine, that is not pierced the surface of the water. So it's not displaced all the bubbles, just some of them. And so that's essentially what a submarine is, or what a sunspot is. It emerges from underneath the surface, stays for a little while, kind of periscope up, and then it submerges back down. And that becomes very important when, it, when, you, uh, when you start looking at solar flares and you start looking at solar activity in general. Now let me flip over here, because obviously a simple sunspot is not the whole story. right? You can have sunspots and sunspot groups that are very complex. And this kind of dynamics, I mean, I'll talk about it for just a second, but this kind of dynamics is something that uh, we will go into when it comes to flare dynamics in another course. This is the stuff I decided to kind of wait because I wanted to talk about solar radio bursts. But as you can imagine, if you have a whole fleet of submarines, and let's say they're enemy submarines and they don't like each other, <laughs> well, they might fight, right? And they might battle one another because they're very close together and they don't want to be there. So that's kind of what happens is a little war ensues when you get really complex looking sunspots emerging uh, all in the same vicinity, okay? And here's kind of what it looks like underneath. Uh, let's see, this is a better way to look. So here is the, sun, the, sub, uh, the uh, submarine, if I get my hand in the right place, there we go. There's the submarine, that's the main part of this thing. This is actually magnetic field that's popping up. It's a big flux bundle, like a big tube of magnetic field coming up to the surface. That's actually blocking the boiling, all the boiling, you know, light emitting stuff, uh, plasma on the other, on, on either side of it. So when you get that, you block all that and the magnetic field comes up through the surface in certain parts. And you'll see, if I stand on this side, you can actually see some of that field kind of plunges back beneath the surface and it kind of partially blocks. And I'll show you another picture of that later. But it kind of partially blocks that water. This is the part of the submarine where the, the penumbra is. This is the submarine that's close to the surface but not quite piercing. So you get that kind of murky looking, you know, oh, I can see a shadow of it, but you don't really see the whole thing. That's due to that section right there. So hopefully that gives you another view of it. Now. There are sunspot classifications, and we will talk a little bit about them uh, probably in another uh, course when I talk about flare dynamics. I'll probably get more into that then. I did present this in the sunspots and telescopes mini course that we did, I think, near the end of last year. So we, are, we have already gone over this, and you can see here's sunspots, let me point of sunspots in white light here. Here's a magnetogram of sunspots. Um, that gives colors that show the magnetic field direction being red and, and blue mainly. This is what I was talking about by, you know, enemy subs. If you think of one team sub being red, you know, the red team and the blue team, <laughs> that's kind of what we're talking about here. They don't like each other very much, and when you see red and blue really close together, eh, that's not really good. Sometimes a red sub will emerge right in the middle of a, a blue team's, you know, convoy you know, circle the wagons kind of thing, and, and that's really unstable. These are the types of things that make us scientists go crazy when we see this type of configuration on the sun. It's really, if you look at it from that kind of, you know, cute war games kind of point of view, it makes it a lot easier to understand what types of, of sunspot groups are, are dangerous and uh, will probably release a very large flare and what ones are more benign. It's really a matter of the red team sticking with the red team and the blue team sticking with the blue team. Um, but, you know, we can get into that more later. But at any rate, I, I do have uh, a little bit of this discussion in the prior uh, sun, Sunspots and Telescopes course, and I'm not going to go over a lot of this right now, but there are all sorts of designations that we have for these sunspot groups and where, what, what is sitting, where the, the different teams are sitting in what camp and that type of thing, and there's all sorts of crazy names for them. Uh, and you're welcome to go to Mount Wilson, for example, to take a better look at all of the the uh, specific de designations and what they are. But I won't take time for that today because I want to get to um, radio. So how does it work with radio? I'm talking a lot about visible sunspots and magnetic fields and stuff, but what does that have to do with radio noise? Well, here we go. Sunspots, yes, they are dark. And I get this question all the time. And you know what, let me, let me pause before I go into this. Let me pause and see what you guys are talking about on on the chat. Does anybody have any questions for me right now? Um, let's see. Sunspots are darker, not due to difference in temperature, but because the light can't escape. Yes, that is right. Uh, that's exactly right. 
I don't care for your submarine analogy. That's confusing. Well, that's too bad, but you'll see, you'll see one of the reasons why I'm using that analogy as time goes on. Um, okay, so yes, I am checking. Good. So everybody's doing well. Okay. So hopefully you'll understand the submarine analogy more as I, as I, well, you know what? I may not go into that too much here. So I think I can skip, I might skip something. It's, submarine analogy is actually very useful when we're talking about um, how sunspots emerge at a particular latitude and disappear, and then they emerge again and they disappear. That's the thing about sunspots is a lot of people think that sunspots are rigid and they just stay on the sun and then just decay. They don't. They actually emerge because they're magnetically buoyant. They, that, and, and there really is rising and falling, just like a lava lamp, like I told you. And so there's a reason why we talk, why I talk submarine. Because it does actually rise up, they stay around for a little while, and then they, they dive back down underneath the surface. And they don't stay. But that doesn't mean the magnetic field that's driving them is, is not, you know, it disappears. And that's, I'll get into that a little bit here because you're going to have to see a bit more about that as I talk about flares. Um, but hopefully, you know, if you can think of a better analogy, let me know. Anyway, okay, so getting back, getting to sunspots, why, why they're dark, but wh how can they possibly be radio loud? Well, anyone who is an amateur radio operator or knows frequencies of radio noise understands that, you know, there are different bands to electromagnetic radiation, right? We see in one particular band, but there are a lot of other bands that we don't see in. And that's exactly the thing about sunspots, is that they actually are dark to our eyes. But that doesn't mean they're quiet, not, not at all. In fact, if we look at, let's see if I can stand on the correct side here, this side. So here is a white light image of, of the sun, and you can see a couple sunspots groups in there. Now, overlaid on that is a plot of the solar flux. Now, amateur radio operators need that quite a bit to be able to do uh, radio propagation and oftentimes they will look at the sun's solar flux and, and the number of sunspots to know what the solar flux is going to be. But the question I always get is, well, why are we looking at dark sunspots for solar flux? It doesn't seem kind of silly. How could something so dark provide us with solar flux? Well, they actually don't, but the plage around them does and that's what ends up being more important. But in this particular case, there's something even more important about why sunspots are are also sources of, of electromagnetic light, and that's because in a different frequency, they're very loud, even though they're visibly dark. So in solar flux, you can actually watch in this one plot, as the, the um, instrument gun it scans over the sunspot group, you can watch that flux drop dramatically, boom, and then it comes back up after they pass over that sunspot. So yes, in solar flux, sunspots are dark, there's no doubt. In the visible eye, sunspots are dark, but if you look at the sun from the radio telescope, this is the VLA radio telescope at 14 gigahertz. So this is quite high, right? Microwave. And you can suddenly see, look, how, look at all those active regions. Look how much they pop out. Those are all sunspots. And they're incredibly loud in radio noise. But here's the trick. And this is why magnetic, why, why those magnetic submarines are so important and why I keep harping on the magnetic field. If you take a look at this last figure here, this is the trace uh, satellite, or spacecraft rather. And what it's looking at is the edge of the sun. So it's looking at the limb of the sun, kind of off to the side, right? And you can see this, let's see if I can point to it, this kind of gray, the dark, dark gray, yeah, that right there, that black, blackish gray. That is the edge of a sunspot just before it disappears off the, off the side of the sun, off the back of the sun's, or onto the sun's backside. So you can barely see the edge of that sunspot. But look just above it, out in the solar atmosphere, just above the sunspot, that is the contour of where they're getting eight, what is it, eight gigahertz radio noise. That's the source of the noise. It's not on the sunspot itself, it's just above it. And why is that? And you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go here for a second for this reason. See, this is one of the reasons why I teach these courses here, and you guys have to deal with me, because I just realized I wanted to do this. So I got to reorder my, my slides a little bit. Why was that radio noise like that? The main reason is because we're dealing with, and when we see a sunspot, it's only part of the story. This is the visible effect that's caused by this magnetic submarine. 
This is the magnetic tube that goes up and back down underneath the surface, right? And as it breaks through the surface, it blocks the sun's light. But look at the loop that extends above the surface of the sun, right? That magnetic loop is everything. That's where the radio noise is coming from. It's not the sunspot itself. It's the magnetic field loop that's sticking out. And that is something that we're going to be seeing over and over again. And it's very critical in the model of the sun. Now, before I, OK, so, so now what I'll do, sorry for flipping through the, the, the slides. I realized I probably should have put that, that magnetic loop earlier. But we'll see it again. <laughs> so what I'm going to do for just a second is I'm going to, because I'm just about to get into radio noise. Okay, and, and really what I just want to remind everybody, because I'm going to talk about plasma just a little bit, and I don't want to be throwing that term around without you guys understanding what a plasma is. It's not scary, it's not crazy, but it is a fourth state of matter. Okay, everybody's used to solid, liquid, and gas, and there's examples there, and then they show the lattice structure. This is a very nice little plot that shows the lattice structure of, let's say, molecules or ions or electrons. And you can see that in a solid, of course, everything is rigidly structured. In a liquid, things can move around, but it's, it, you know, they're not quite as rigidly structured, but they're still really dense. In a gas, um, if I stand further back this way, in a gas, you can see things are, you know, really, there's a lot less density, and they can fill any container. Uh, they always fill the container as much as they can. But then you have a plasma. And the difference with the plasma is basically, it's essentially a gas, but in a plasma, all it is is it's ionized. It means nothing's neutral, okay? And in space, everything is like that. You don't have neutral anything in space. Everything is charged. So you take atoms and you break off their electrons and you strip them. And you don't always strip them down to the core, but you can strip a lot of electrons off a lot of different atoms. So nothing, because of that, you e everything is either positively charged or negatively charged in a plasma. Now here at Earth, an example of plasma is lightning. Okay, that's a great example because there's, it's a dense plasma. Particles are banging into one another. But in space, it's not like that. Lightning in space looks smooth. It doesn't go because it's not bouncing off other particles and hitting different particles and causing these really radial kind of crazy lightning looking, you know, branches like a gnarled tree. In, in space, there's a lot less particles, period, because it's a vacuum essentially. There are particles that are still there, but now they don't touch each other. But because they're charged, they're paying attention to the magnetic and electric fields that are out in space. So they still talk to each other. And that's incredibly important because the nature of this kind of plasma is what allows this, not just this plasma, not just collisionless plasma, but also collisional plasma like you see in lightning. Those kinds of, of, of gases, these special, um, these special types of gases that see magnetic and electric fields, they're the ones that allow all sorts of processes to take place that couldn't take place otherwise. And that's part of why radio noise is what it is and why the magnetic field ends up being so important when it comes to generating radio noise during solar flares. So I just wanted to make sure that you understood that what we are talking about in these cases is either a, a plasma that is collisional, like really when we're like deep in the sun, uh, that's, that's part of the collisional plasma. There's the, the plasma actually, these, these particles actually do hit each other. Electrons and, and protons actually do either hit each other or come close to hitting each other. They feel each other's effect, or we're collisionless, and they're interacting solely by the electric and magnetic fields that are all around them. And if you think of it from a collisionless point of view, if you think of it as if these particles were connected by a spider web, okay, you could have a spider web, and you could have a, a, a particle, let's say a, a proton or an electron, on one edge of the spider web, and another one on the other edge. And yeah, they're not going to touch each other, right? There's no way they can. But if you shake the web over here, it's going to make this one wiggle on this side. And those, that spider web, that is the electric and magnetic fields that are connecting these particles together. And it allows for a behavior, believe it or not, that's to a great degree similar to what you would expect if they actually were touching each other, because they are still communicating. But this is the real, this is the magic about what makes space and space physics 
and some of radio astronomy so amazing is because it's, it combines both things that we understand and, and forces that we understand and then forces that are a lot harder to see and a lot harder to predict. So it's, it, I just wanted you to keep in mind that that's what a plasma is. It shouldn't be anything scary to you, but it should kind of be distinct in your mind from just a gas because now you have to deal with this spider web. You've introduced this spider web that then controls kind of how things happen. And it's not just a bunch of billiard balls banging into one another, because that's not that's that's the way it works in neutral gases, but it's not how it works in plasmas. So let me see if anybody asks any questions here. Um, oh, thank you. Oh yes, yeah, she's see through. Uh oh, is there? I have plasma eyes. Oh shoot, did it did it do that? Okay. Am I am I losing my eyes again? I have blue eyes and it's a green screen. Oh yeah, I see that. Yuck. I wonder if I can bring the lights closer. Sometime the lighting changes. Let me see if this helps. Oh, are my eyes still all freaky? Oh, they're a little bit better, I think. Are they a little bit better or am I all freaked out? <laughs> Sorry, guys. I don't mean to be like a... Um, I can't pay attention to her. The phenomena is such a semantic distraction. She's so amazing. Oh, gosh, what am I... Or you're fading, Marty McFly, and someone needs to restore your timeline. Oh, gosh. It's that bad, huh? Okay, let me see if I can fix this, guys. So you might see me disappear for a second while I, um, while I, so what you're going to see is me disappear, and you're just going to see this background for a minute. And I'm going to adjust, yeah, I see my eyes are all nasty. I'm going to adjust the green screen for just a second and see if I can do this. But I have to take myself off of the program in order to do that. So if you see me disappear, don't worry, you're still going to hear me. <laughs> I think you'll still hear me. And I'm just adjusting the green screen so I don't look so ghosty. Because, um, yeah, it freaks me out, too, when I see that. So thanks for letting me know. So let's see. Okay. Let's see, is this better? What do you guys think? Am I better? Now, I might have a little bit more of a green haze all over me, but hopefully that's better. What do you guys think? <laughs> Eyes fine it's, is negative blue and positive red. Um, what do you mean from the, from the, from, from the, the magnetogram from earlier from the sunspots? Um, if you're asking about the sunspots, the, the one direction is, is radially outward and the other is radially inward, and I forget right at the moment which color is what. But I think, I think my eyes look better. I do have a little bit more of a green haze, but hopefully this will still work. What do you guys think? Is it better? Better. Good. It's better. This woman needs to be on television. Somebody should, oh, that's sweet. We'll work on it. We'll work on it. Now you are, now you reappeared. Cool. Okay. Um... Oh, some people think it's talking silly. Well, you know what? It, it messes me up, too. So, I mean, I, I end up not being able to watch anything because it's just, like, it, it's just too creepy. <laughs> I don't like looking like that. So, okay. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, sometimes those things get really distracting, and, and you just can't help it. And I, 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 I'm one of those people. So now everybody's right Nobody's going to be looking at my eyes anymore. Everybody's going to be looking at the green haze that's around my hair and everything else. And You know, it, it is what it is. I, I, I work in a private studio, and, and my, my live green screen is only what it is. So I can only do so much. But hopefully this is better. It's a better choice than what we had. Okay, let's get back to it. <laughs> oh, don't you love live? Okay. So now let's get into the good stuff. This is where we're really going to start talking about the radio observations and what, what they, um, how, they, how they are associated with, with uh, solar flares. Now, radio waves from our solar atmosphere recognize immediately, and I want to drive this into you, that the frequency of the radio noise that you get, or the radio burst that you hear, <clears throat> or that you, me you know, measure, um, I don't want to say hear because we don't hear radio, but 
uh, that are, are antennas here, let's say it, let's put it that way. The frequency will decrease with decreasing altitude as you move higher in the solar al atmosphere. The main reason for that, there's a lot of math involved, and we're not, don't worry, we're not going to get into that, thank goodness. Uh, but the reason for that mainly has to do with the fact that the magnetic field strength of the sun kind of goes down as you go up in altitude. And so the higher the magnetic field strength, the higher frequency the, uh, the, radio, fre the radio noise that you hear. So you'll start noticing that that the highest energy stuff will be really close to the sun and the lower energy stuff as you move out drops in frequency. So you get lower energy radio waves as you move out. And that actually goes pretty much all the way out to Earth. It's very interesting when you, when you look at the dynamics here. Um, so what that, what's neat about that is that you're able to use, let's see, I guess I can stand on this side. You're able to use that to kind of sound the different frequencies of radio noise coming off the sun and also the different layers of the atmosphere of the sun. Very similar to what we did with, uh, with uh, extreme ultraviolet, with SDO. Remember the colors, all the different colors of the sun? We're peeling the sun like an onion. Well, believe it or not, you can do the same thing with radio astronomy, not using ultraviolet light, but using radio light, okay? Using light of a totally different frequency. So here, for example, on this, on this side here, we've got 17 gigahertz. And look at how the sun, look at what the, the, uh, what the sun looks like in 17 gigahertz, okay? Now, if we flip over to the VLA, you can see the VLA. This was, again, like, what, 13, 12 or 13 gigahertz? I can't remember what we, oh, well, sorry, 1.4 gigahertz, my fault. 1.4 gigahertz, that was the um, radio noise there. And then as we go to uh, even less than a gigahertz, only a third of a gigahertz, now you're beginning to go even further out and you're seeing uh, the solar atmosphere. So and you see how it gets kind of tenuous? <clears throat> so we go from basically the surface of the sun here at, at 17 gigahertz, okay, to active regions that are a little bit higher in the, out, at, in the atmosphere to the solar atmosphere itself, the solar corona. Kind of neat, huh? So as you go down in radio frequency, you go higher in altitude. And it's really kind of neat because it allows us as scientists to be able to probe some of the phenomena that occur. Wait, did that happen? Okay. Oh, I have two charts of the same? Oh, sorry about that. No, again, live. Okay. So I'm not really going to talk about much about this. Uh, I put it up here so that you are able to see what types of radio emission mechanisms there are. This is not a course on physics, so if you want to know more about things, about the, the particulars of these types of uh, radiation, you know, radio radiation uh, and emission, really you're going to need to look that up uh, on your own. Don't be surprised, though, that you get, if, if you don't have a degree in radio astronomy or, or physics, don't be surprised if you get lost in the weeds really fast because you have to start learning things. If we were to talk about the physics of these, of these different types of emission mechanisms like plasma radiation or the, cycl uh, the uh, cyclotron maser, synchrotron emission, or thermal radiation, we start getting into the actual radiation mechanisms and we're getting into high energy physics. And we start going into things. You have to learn things about plasma frequencies and gyro radii. And I mean, it just goes, it goes on and deeper and deeper. And the math can start getting a bit ugly because you start getting into um, plasma kinetics and wave growth and all the different types of wave modes there are. And it, it gets, it, anytime you deal with, with kinetics, you can get very ugly math very quickly. So I, I'm not going to say don't look into these types of, of, you know, more deeply into these types of radiation. If you want them, here they are. But honestly, um, for the level of course that we're teaching, probably better just to kind of look at this and say, okay, these are the types that we mainly use, but you know, don't, don't get too freaked out if you go look at this stuff and try to understand it, and it gets over your head very quickly. This is just a, a warning from me to you. <laughs> okay. Back to the more conceptual aspect, because remember, that's really what we're focused on. Uh, magnetic loops are really where the, mag ma where the magic happens. Uh, we're back to this diagram again that I showed earlier, and as you can see, one of the reasons, why, and I'm thinking about that submarine um, analogy again, you know, the reason again why I use the submarine is that you have something that goes up and goes back down, um, and also this whole system 
will rise up. You know, the loop is actually po point, uh, uh, poked through the surface of the sun because of the buoyancy, the buoyancy of this whole structure. Oops, let me scoot over a little bit. The buoyancy of this whole magnetic structure has kind of risen up slowly and popped through the surface. And then slowly, as it begins to decay, will begin to fall back underneath the surface. And so that's why you see these spots come up. And there's usually two spots, because you, it's really part of a magnetic um, flux tube, a big magnetic bundle that comes up. But because you have the magnetic loop sitting above the, out, the, the surface of the, of, the, um, you know, of the sunspot, now you have an altitude difference, right? You've got uh, something at the surface. And remember, we talked about radio noise. And the highest frequency radio noise is going to be really close to the surface. And then as you go up in altitude, things begin to change. That should clue you in. That is, as we go up this loop, things are going to change. Okay, And that's exactly what we're about to see. But again, to remind you, um, it's the magnetic loop continues below the surface. I mean, the, you know, this flux tube continues below the surface. And it's all connected into the solar dynamo and the magnetic field that actually drives the sun. All of these little sunspots are just manifestations of a much larger system that really is connected to the solar dynamo. Now, oh, one thing I do want to tell you, keep in mind this loop, OK? And keep in mind that this is just something very simple that we show. But oftentimes, these loops, there's ribbons. They actually exist over a long period or long, um, uh, over, over a long space. And we'll talk about that in a second. I'm going to actually show some of these ribbons right now. So here's a bunch of, let's see if I can stand out of the way. Here's a bunch of images of a particular um, example of, of a, a in this case, it was a filament eruption. But there was a big flare that was associated with it. And remember, I was talking about the layers of the onion. So we go from reasonably close to the surface of the sun, up, 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 higher, 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 and even higher still. And you can see near the surface of the sun, we see these two ribbons. Now, this is the type of dynamic. We're going to talk about flare ribbons. I'll talk more about this dynamic uh, probably in the next course, but I'm only going to briefly mention it. And I just wanted to show it so that you guys got a kind of an idea of what we're talking about. Um, so when you see it in the standard model, you'll know what I mean. So you've got these two ribbons, and you can see them a little bit better here, and then even really good in the 304 angstroms right here. So you see those bright regions. Those are the kind of like the foot points of where flares occur. Okay, now. Really, where that is is kind of along a new, what we call a neutral line between sunspots. But it, it's it's still. I'll go in more into the flare dynamics when we when we actually uh, uh, when we get to that point. Um, now we go a little bit higher in the altitude. Let's see if I can get to the right point to the right place. Here we go. This this particular image. Now what you're beginning to see is more the energy that's associated with the flare itself. This is part of that those magnetic loops that go up and down. Okay. And I'll talk more about that. But you can see, even when we get into really high energies, you can start really seeing those magnetic loops that begin to, to, um, you know, to, to erupt when, uh, or in this case, reform once the flare is done. But you can actually see little spindles, if you want to call them that, at some of these things. And you can definitely see it in 171. I believe that's 171 angstroms. And it's a very. Um, Geez, it's a very active and very stochastic kind of thing that happens. And I'll play a movie for you. And this is going to be the only eye candy, really, that I'm going to play in this particular course. Um, because what we're, I, again, I don't want to concentrate too much on the flare dynamics in this, in this particular course. I want to talk about the radio bursts. But I kind of want to give you at least some visual of what a flare looks like uh, as it's erupting. In, in, a decent resolution. So I'm going to stand over here for a second and just show you. This is 171 angstroms. So you can see a lot of the good resolution. This is um, extreme ultraviolet. This is iris, which is actually um, a much higher resolution instrument. And so it looks a little bit different. But uh, you get to see the same flare with iris. And you can see far more detail with iris than you do with SDO. And I'm going to play this movie now. But this will show you the ribbons as they, as they go. Here it comes. There we go. See those ribbons? Now, in SDO, you can see it just saturates. 
right? But in Iris, you're actually still able to see those flare ribbons, and I'll play it one more time. So here we go again, and you can see it's very bursty. So there's a lot of radio noise being given off right through all of this as those ribbons continue to kind of like, I don't want to say tear, but as they continue to scar like that. But as, as those ribbons evolve, you definitely are getting to see, um, th that's definitely when a lot of radio noise is being released, and the sun is essentially screaming. Okay, so how does this happen? Well, let's talk about hard X-ray emission. And that's going to be the first thing we talk about. So now what you're looking at with this image, excuse me, I want to take a sip. Now what you're looking at is kind of an image of the sun on the side, right? And I'm going to, yeah, I guess I can do this. And you're looking at one of those, those loops, right, from the edge. What we had looked at from the top down, now you're looking at it from the side. Okay, and really, that's that kind of like mag the same as that magnetic loop that I showed you with the sunspot kind of going like that. That magnetic loop staying up at the at the top of you know at, at, let me say this, the magnetic loop that connects these two, it's up at the top and it's high, it's higher in altitude than being at the surface. And so up at the top of this thing, you can imagine that if you have particles, you have plasma that's up here that's traveling from the top to the bottom. Right? You could actually have that cause some X-ray emission or cause some, some type of radio noise. Just the traveling of, of, uh, of particles here, and in this case we're going to do an electron beam, traveling from the, from the top of this loop down to the bottom, okay? just because of the, 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 in the eruption itself, plasma is always going to be moving, but it's going to travel along the magnetic field because it has to obey the magnetic field. That's the thing with plasma. Again, different from a neutral gas. It, the magnetic field, to some degree, jails these particles. So as they travel, in this case, from the top of the loop down to the foot point, and I'll put this down here. Can you see that? Whew, going down to the foot point of the, of the thing. That's where you actually get hard X-ray emission right down there at the foot point, boom, there's hard X-ray emission right there, okay? So what happens is that as you get this beam that goes down, whoops, let me, I'll just stand on the side, I'll stay on the side and let you look at the picture. You can get collisions with other particles, in this case protons, and that causes a type of, it causes a type of radiation. Some of you might be familiar with something called bremsstrahlung. If you are, it's then great. If not, it's a kind of radiation that, that you realize as these, as these electrons are coming down, they've actually got to stop when they hit to the, get to the surface of the sun. And we call bremsstrahlung radiation breaking radiation. When you're going by other particles that are, um, that are exerting a force on you, it's going to change your direction. And for particles like electrons to do that, they actually end up emitting x-rays in order to do that. And this is the hard x-ray spectrum that we see when we look at, for instance, GOES, you know, this GOES satellite and we see a flare happening, we see hard x-rays. Well, that's part of where that source is coming from, is that we're seeing uh, plasma electrons going from the center of these loops, as, especially as they break, uh, uh, the, as the loops begin to break due to due to the reconnection, I don't, I don't want to use that word, um, due to the reconfiguration of the magnetic field, uh, the loops will begin to break, and as they break, then the, the particles travel all the way down to the foot points, like you see, and that causes that, as they have to move and stop and they go by other protons, that actually causes them to emit hard x-rays. And so that's where you get these big hard x-ray um, contours, you get these hard x-ray, what they call sources, right there at the foot points, right where you see that, I'll see if I can point to it, over here, over here, up, 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 that, right there, that, right at that point is where you see the hard x-ray sources, mainly, but it's due to these electrons that are being shot down these magnetic field lines and down this plasma um, due to this big flare that's occurring. But again, at the surface of the sun, that's where you're going to get the highest energy stuff, and that's why you see x-rays there. Now, now is a good time to talk about, I guess, the, the, um, the standard flare model. And again, because this is a new course, and this is, <laughs> I probably should have had maybe one or two other plots to, to kind of ease you into this. 
um, but I'll do my best. For those of you who are familiar with the CME courses that we took, this diagram should be pretty familiar. Actually, this one will be even more familiar to you. This is one I used uh, quite a bit in the set of CME courses because as we looked at uh, coronal mass ejections and the big solar storms that lifted off of the sun, especially in coronagraphs, this idea of having a loop here, this big yellow loop, um, being something that eventually released, was released off of the sun and shot off into the, you know, into interplanetary space, this made sense because we actually saw exactly this picture with coronagraphs. So I apologize for those of you uh, who have not taken the, the CME, the set of CME courses. This may be an area where you get a little bit kind of like lost in the weeds because you've not seen this image before. And I'll, I've got to think about how to kind of tighten that up for, for, for those people who have not seen um, the, the CME stuff. But at any rate, when we talk about magnetic loops on the sun, and I guess I'll, I'll move over to this side now. When we talk about magnetic loops on the sun, you can see in this diagram, you can see the loop foot points down in here. OK. Uh, oh, I'm really messing up, aren't I? Scoot over. I'm trying to point to them. OK. So here are the loop foot points. There's one of them, and then you can see the other one on the other side. And you've got that big red loop in the middle, right? OK, that red loop is kind of what you saw with those loops that I just showed you in the previous figure. OK, but those loops actually are also, as they, as they begin to move out, those loops will actually pinch. They'll come up and they'll pinch tight. And so what you're seeing in this upper part of the figure is really what happens when the loop pinches tight. And this is kind of what we talked about in the, uh, in the CME course, because this upper part right here, that becomes the coronal mass ejection that leaves. So this is a little bit tough for, for those of you who are not familiar with, uh, with coronal mass ejections. But if I step over here, you can kind of see that. So you go from, from this first picture here, where you've got that picture that's the loop, where you've got the pinching of that loop. So you first start with a magnetic loop that then kind of get pinched, and it pinches in the middle. And, and so you get this kind of configuration with this yellow with this yellow uh, set of plasma here, this bigger yellow loop um, being kind of isolated from the lower part of the sun. And then if you jump to the next part of the figure, those field lines have broken. And now this yellow thing is allowed to, is kind of released. It's now become what we call a flux rope. And it now erupts and leaves the sun, leaving smaller loops behind. See the smaller loops? And those smaller loops are part of what uh, creates the radio noise along with the loops on the top. They create a different kind of radio noise. And guess what? From what I told you, the bottom loops, because they're closer to the sun, you think they create higher uh, frequency noise than the loops at the top? Yeah. So here is where you get all your x-ray, hard x-ray, soft x-ray, and microwave radiation. It's mostly from this region in here. And the other stuff? That, those are the radio bursts that are actually lower in frequency. They're still gigahertz, but they're only about one gigahertz and down. Uh, and that stuff can actually go all the way down to kilometric radiation. And we can follow the, that radiation all the way out. It's chirping and making noise and screaming all the way out to Earth and beyond. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But keep in mind that as this model uh, shows, at least the ones with the coronal mass ejections leaving, you get the high, you have kind of two separate sources for radio noise. So when I step over here, back again at this model, I'm trying to do my best to explain this without keeping in mind some of you probably haven't seen the CME stuff. Um, we've got the loops down here, and you can see all the circles that we've got. These are the circles where, where people are looking for uh, X, a lot of x-ray noise. Uh, but you've got, you've got the, a loop, you've got X, hard X-ray noise is going to be at the loop foot points. You're going to be uh, in this hot flare loop is where you get soft X-ray emission. Just above it where you see that arrow, yeah, right there, that is where you get a lot of microwave emission. And then as you go further up, you get emission that's what we're going to go into is like type 1 through, or it's actually, in this case, type 3 and sometimes type 2 radiation. And we'll talk a little bit about it. But a lot of this has to do with whether or not you're in the top part of the loop that's going this way or you're in the bottom part of the loop that's zipping back down to the sun. Because what's happening is stuff is breaking. And you either have stuff releasing this way, or you have stuff going this way. And that means you have electron and proton beams going out, 
and electron and proton beams going in, okay? Meaning up or down. And as they go down, you get higher frequency radio noise. As they go up, you get lower frequency radio noise. But there's two separate things happening. Pretty cool, huh? All due to this solar flare where most of the light, a lot of the light is happening right here. This is where some of the most beautiful stuff happens because that's where you're seeing all these loops. This is what we call the magic area, which is the reconnection region. This is where the magnetic field just really reconfigures and changes, and that's where a lot of the energy is released. And it drives everything else, kind of like a big explosion, both above and below. Hopefully that explains that well enough. Here's another shot that kind of does the same thing. Let's see if I can stand. No, let's stand on this side. And this may explain it better. I may, have, I may do this, put this one ahead of the other one. Whoop, bye, baby, out of here. OK. Um, so actually, no, I have to stand here. I can't clear myself, can I? OK, so if we, we talk about the top here, this is where that magnetic, what was a single magnetic loop, it now is beginning to pinch in. See how it pinches in? And as it pinches in like that, you start seeing, um, you start seeing that, that region right in the middle where it's going to start what we so call reconnecting, okay? Once it pinches in and reconnects, then suddenly you can jump down here and you get two sets of loops. You get the loops that are reforming back at, at the surface of the sun. This is what we get when we see those bright ribbons and what's left over of those ribbons. And I'll talk again about more about flare dynamics uh, in probably the next course. And we'll talk far more about what are called post um, post-eruptive arcades, and that's kind of what you're seeing here. That's what these low loops are. They reform after the, the solar storm, the CME, has been launched. And then you get this top thing here, Whoop, down here, yes, this. That is the flux rope. That is the CME that lets off. So if I stand on this side now, back to the main standard model, you can see the hot flare loop here, this red. That's the part that stays. Okay, and that's where a lot of the, the uh, X-ray emission, soft X-ray emission is coming from. The hard X-ray emission is coming from the foot points down here, the red where, they, where that, that loop anchors. And then you have the magic with the reconnection region, driving stuff both this way and back down. Okay, so let me try to show a little bit about that with real observations instead of just cartoons. <laughs> Hopefully you can see this. So this is Yoko. And Yoko was uh, one of the few, if not the only, uh, well, one of the few, X-ray imagers, we full disk X-ray imagers we've ever had, XST. It was the first, um, the first time we ever imaged the solar atmosphere. We had never, prior to Yoko, we had no idea what we would see if we would do a full disk image of the sun. And I think I talked about that in my sunspots and telescopes, because I, I go into, or, or I talk about, no, I talked about that in my, in one of the CME courses. Because before that, all we had were coronagraphs. And so we saw white light images of, of coronal mass ejections lifting off the edge of the sun, but we had no idea what the solar atmosphere really looked like. So Yoko was land breaking in that regard, because it just opened our eyes to a whole other world of what, um, what, what solar dynamics was. So here's a full disk image of, of Yoko, and you can see if you focus on this little, oh, where is it? <laughs> this little blue, yeah, this little flare up here, if I can get to it, right there. That little flare, that is actually imaged and blown up here. And what you're seeing is that, that kind of looks like a piece of macaroni. <laughs> that macaroni is actually the, the loop, that, that hot loop that we were talking about. And that uh, especially where you see yellow and red, that's really where you're getting a lot of soft X-ray emission. Okay, you're getting, um, and this is from, from electrons that are, that are moving down and, and from what we call plasma emission, uh, moving down the, the, in, in this area, slowly, slowly sinking. And we get a lot of, of soft X-ray and we also get some microwave emission from this region. And then you can see the contours right at the foot points especially. Those, that's where the hard X-ray contours, that's where the source of the hard X-rays are coming from. So sure enough, even back in the day with Yoko, when we started imaging these, these flares for real, we actually realized that yes, we are getting soft X-ray, lower, lower um, energy X-rays from that, that higher loop, and we're getting the hard X-ray sources right from the, um, from the base, from the emission of the, of the, from that, those electron beams that are coming down. And you can also get a hard X-ray source at the location where that, let's see if I can point to it, 
at the location where that flare uh, reconnection region is right there. See how the reconnection is up here somewhere? Well, right at the right below it is where you can also get both microwave emission and another hard X-ray source. And here's a better image of it. This comes from NJIT. They have an excellent uh, so, uh, radio astronomy um, lecture that uh, I, gr I grabbed a lot of stuff from because they were it was it was just done very very well and at a level that's really good. So I uh, I strongly advise you to go take a look at it. Um, NGIT's got a lot of good solar astronomy people. And so let me stand on this side. Uh, so what we're dealing with here is again that same standard model. You can see down here, you can see the, the HXR, that's the hard X-ray foot points. That's where you get the major part of the X-ray, or the hard, yeah, the high energy stuff. You got soft X-ray slightly above it, see that in that loop? But then there's a little bit of a microwave emission, that's MW, that microwave emission sitting there. Now you can see the arrows going both down and up, okay? Keep that in mind, because again, a lot of the types of, of uh, emission, radio emission, is caused by... Uh, the movement of electrons either up or down. And if you look at some of the, the emissions that they show, they're oftentimes very um, striated. They've got lots of different burst, bursty type signatures. And we think a lot of that has to do with because there's so many different loops and they're all bursting in different places. And the reconnection and everything is happening not as one big event, but as a bunch of tiny little events all over the place. And I'm not going to get into the details of that, but we've talked about X and O lines and all these types of things in, in, as scientists because we think that there's a bunch of little magnetic islands and it's kind of more like a honeycomb structure when the magnetic field comes together and pinches together and reconnects. It's not just one field line that's doing it, it's a bunch of them and they're happening in all sorts of little places. So it causes things to be bursty. And so you get a lot of this kind of thing. Um, and uh, and yeah, and I'm not going to go into the slants of the directions of these bursts, but at least it shows you kind of a, a little bit about what we're, where things are or where the source is of these types of things. I don't want to go too much into, into the details, but just know that you can once again see downward beams and upward beams, and those become the real reason or the real thing that, that separates the types of, of radiation that we see. Uh, again, here's another example. I guess I can stand maybe in the middle. Another example of uh, looking at how the, in, the frequency of radio emission really depends upon um, the altitude that you're at. And in this case, it's, uh, this is microwave emission. So we're looking, let's see, which way do I point? No, yes, this way, okay. So we're looking here at, uh, they, they talked about the, the foot point and the top, that's what the F and the T stand for. But if you look at the frequencies that they've measured, when they look at this loop, this, this, uh, this is an H-alpha image of a loop that's coming up, you can see it's 9 to 14 gigahertz really close to the surface of the sun, but as you move outward, it drops, okay? And clear up at the top of this thing, you're only getting 1 gigahertz. But all of this radio emission is happening all at the same time. So the sun, believe it or not, is screaming at tons of different frequencies. And you know, granted, the, the loudness of the scream all definitely depends, and the length of time that the sun is screaming definitely depends upon what frequency you're looking at. But if in any case anyone thinks that the sun can't scream at, satellite, at frequencies like the K-band emission or at microwave emissions, or even at the, the bands that GPS, like 1.67 gigahertz, or satellite phones at 1.45 gigahertz, anybody who thinks that these types of technologies are, are immune to solar radio noise, and it's just amateur radio, you know, that even VHF and UHF, they, they don't get affected, uh, I beg to differ. There are many times when the sun will scream at so many different frequencies, and if we get a flare that's large enough, it will scream at so many different frequencies with such intensity that it can knock out at all. It can completely wipe communications off the map. Not that the communications in the satellites or the satellite phones or the transmitters aren't working. They're working just fine. But it's that same idea as the train tracks, the cricket and the train, right? You can have a cricket that's chirping near the train tracks, and you can hear that cricket as long as a train doesn't go by. But as that train screams by, you're not going to hear that cricket until the train's gone. And once that train stops screaming and it's gone, now you can hear the cricket again. No doubt the cricket was chirping the whole time. But in this case, if the train is louder than the cricket, 
you're not going to hear the cricket. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, and and I, will, I will show examples, not in this particular uh, course. I'll save that for the next course. But I will, I will mention a few examples for you. But I just want you to keep in mind that this is very real. Okay, here's a quick example of, of different mi of microwave emission. Let me stand on this side maybe? No, let me stand on this side. Just so you can peek, see a peak. This goes from, this plot goes from one, over here, one uh, gigahertz to 10 gigahertz. One is at the top, 10 is out at the bottom. I, I don't know why, I think it's historical that they plot it this way. But uh, you can see there, there's tons of microwave uh, noise at these frequencies even up to 10 gigahertz. So satellite communications definitely get impacted. And it's going to be very interesting with Starlink and you know, lots of other uh, uh, very, very talkative uh, constellations that are being launched. Because the more talkative they are, the higher susceptibility they have to radio bursts like this. And here's three radio bursts, peak one, peak two, peak three, uh, in a very short time frame. Right? And if you look at the peaks on this side, this is the plot that shows peak 1, 2, and 3 in blue here, you can see that the frequency goes up to 10 gigahertz. We're talking about you know, 14, 15 gigahertz. Look at all these peaks. So you're getting peaks in these communications. So it's bursty. right? You're not necessarily always getting something all the time. But it's going to be happening enough with big solar flares. It's going to be happening frequently enough that you can uh, really start messing up uh, your communications. Here's more examples of microwave emissions. I probably won't go into it uh, in too great a detail, other than to say it's all over the map. The types of flares that we have, you can see in, in, in these scales, hopefully you can read them, they go up to 18, is this 18 gigahertz in this one? Yeah, 18 gigahertz from basically 1.2 to 18 gigahertz. So, and you can see the types of shapes. Everywhere you see white or a light gray, this is emission. And there is no one size fits all. There's all sorts of different types of emission, all sorts of different durations, all sorts of different uh, uh, intensities that can happen with solar flares. And they can all happen at these very high frequencies. And they can be very broadband. So in this case, you've got 1 gigahertz all the way up to uh, 18 gigahertz. And that's satellite. That's satellite phone. That's GPS. Um, and, that's, and, and all of that is uh, radio noise that is all coming from the, the stuff, the, the part of the flare that stays. Right? We're not now talking necessarily about the, flare, the part of the flare that, that helps to launch a coronal mass ejection up and off. That's the stuff we're about to talk about now. The stuff that's up at the, uh, that stays close to the sun, that's where all that really high frequency noise comes from. Now we're going to talk about the types, what are class classically called the types of radio bursts. I'm sure you've heard scientists say from time to time, uh, oh, there's a type 3 burst, and that means a coronal mass ejection has been launched. We now have a solar storm coming to Earth. Or there's a type 2. Yeah, that's, that, that's another, that's a coronal mass ejection. We know it's coming. True, because really, if there weren't a coronal mass ejection being launched, there'd be nothing leaving that solar atmosphere to give you those low frequencies. Everything would be high frequency emission. So that's one of the cool things about radio astronomy, too, is that if you only have really high frequency emission and you don't have these lower frequency radio bursts that go from gigahertz on down, um, you're, you probably don't have a solar storm coming at you. So uh, now granted there are problems with being able to hear it. There are problems, you know, you have to be able to be in the right place at the right time and have a radio telescope aimed at the right place to be able to get to it. But nonetheless, if there is a solar, a solar storm being launched, you're going to get these types of radio bursts. And there's a whole bunch of names. There's type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, and type 5. And there are also subclasses. Whoops, let me stand on this side. So you can see type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, and type 5. There are subclasses of, of these types. So some of them are, are stationary and some are moving. I'm not going to go through this in great detail. I will highlight, however, type 2 and type 3 are the types that are most commonly associated with solar storms coming towards Earth. And when you get type 2 and type 3, you will continue to get noise all the way out until that solar storm hits Earth. And again, that will be something I'll go more into in the next course as I talk more about flare dynamics. We'll talk more about these particular types and really what they're associated with. But you can hopefully read a little bit of it here. 
Uh, I just have this up pretty much for reference right now. But what really gets interesting is when we talk about this and how, how interesting it looks different on your screen than it does on mine. The type 4, this big red bubble, it's not supposed to be striated. It's just supposed to be red. So if you see it striated, like it's got a red, brown, red, brown look to it, which I see on my screen here, I don't know. It's not supposed to be that way. <laughs> so sorry about that. So anyway, um, let me so let me get over here for just a second, see if I can get out of the way enough. I need to give myself more room on these charts for me to stand. I'm too big. I, I need to make them smaller because I'm blocking too much. So what I've done with this particular chart, and I'll keep jumping from side to side to help, what I've done is I've tried to kind of like uh, boil down that last chart to really what are the actionable sides of or a aspects of the, the different types of radio bursts. So you have, in this case, you have the microwave bursts up at the top. Those are broadband. They're about 500 megahertz to many gigahertz, as we saw, up to 18 gigahertz and beyond. Um, and this that wreaks havoc with satellite communications typically, but can wreak havoc with, with ground um, communications as well, and especially in the broadcast um, arena. But then we go down into the other types. So these are what we call type, you know, the, the typical type 1 to type 5 uh, radio bursts. These are typically bursty ones, and they're either narrow band or broad band, depending upon, um, de depending upon which type they are. And again, it's the type 2 and type 3 that are associated with um, coronal mass ejections with the solar storms. And I guess I could walk, walk you through them, but what I'll do in actuality is now I'll stand on this side and I will talk about this chart a little bit. So what you're seeing here is a plot that should kind of summarize really where these, where these bursts lie. And what you're looking at is the time since a, since a flare happened. So, you know, basically at time zero, that's when the flare lights up, okay? And that's where you're going to get all that hard, all that really high energy stuff. It's all going to happen. Well, not all of it, but a lot of it, it's going to start then. But then there's going to be stuff that will continue on out. As a matter of fact, this one only goes 90 minutes, so an hour and a half after the flare occurs. But believe it or not, the mission continues way beyond 90 minutes. Uh, continues all the way out till the, the, the solar storm, if there's one launched, uh, hits Earth. But this is kind of like the early part, you know, of, of let's say, a, a big eruptive event on the sun. Um, and it gives you an idea. So it gives you the timing, you know, how long something lasts and when it starts. Because if you notice, not everything starts right when the flare hits. Some of it starts a little bit later. But it also gives you the frequency, right? So up on this, on the vertical axis is frequency. And we're talking in megahertz, so we're talking here, in this case, 10 megahertz up to 3,000, so that's 3 gigahertz, okay? Now, up at the top, you see the microwave burst, right, and, and, and uh, decimetric the continuum. That's all the stuff that's happening in those low-lying loops really close to the sun. That's the stuff that continues to burn long after the flare is over, okay? And, of course, along with that stuff, you get uh, the hard X-ray and soft X-ray emission as well. But you can see that in that kind of that blue bubble. You can see kind of the frequency range and the time range that that stuff lasts. So you're getting up in the multi gigahertz range with the microwave emission, and you're getting, yeah, you know, maybe up to about half an hour uh, after the flare starts before that stuff kind of burns down. Basically, you're getting a lot of the plasma, a lot of the electrons kind of slowly draining. If you, any of you have seen coronal rain where you're seeing all this plasma kind of dripping back down to the surface of the sun. It's emitting microwaves. And so maybe next time when I actually show examples of flare dynamics, I will show that classic example of plasma rain. If you've ever seen coronal, coronal plasma rain on the sun, you can go Google that video. It's a great video to watch. But just know that when it's happening, you're actually seeing uh, microwave emission on the sun. Okay. Now, as we also, um, let's see, what can I talk about? What do I want to talk about first? I guess I'll talk about the type 3 burst. This is the, see this big long, these long, long set of lines that go straight down? That is a type 3 burst. Now, insanely enough, look how broadband it is. I mean, it goes from several gigahertz, typically 1 or 2 gigahertz, all the way down to kilometric. I mean, really low energy stuff, right? And this is... When we see this signal, we see this kind of uh, very sharp 
um, burst going out, this signals, okay, there's been a coronal mass ejection launched along with this flare. And so that's what we, oftentimes when you hear type three, type three, that's when you know a, a decent sized uh, coronal mass ejection is coming. And it is, it's a big radio burst that, that ends up lasting. It can last, actually the, they so, show the type three only lasting a few minutes, but in actuality the type three can last quite a, a, quite a bit longer than that. But you can guarantee that um, HF radio will be out during this period if it's a big flare and it has, and it's launching uh, a coronal mass ejection as well. Uh, because it's so incredibly broadband. And then that uh, oftentimes will have, you'll end up having type 2. You see the type 2 bursts that kind of follow afterwards. See that? Those type 2 bursts, they occur a little bit later, and they're from a slightly different, and I'll show you um, examples of them in a minute. But again, because of coronal mass ejections, typically. Then you also have a type 4, which is a little bit more like, um, that's all the, the uh, uh, that big cloud of red stuff. That, that can be from, it's, not, it's, it's also broadband, but it's also typically a lot lower intensity. And that oftentimes ends up being from the storm, the, the big solar storm, the CME coming towards Earth. Uh, and we'll, again, talk more about that later. But then you also get type 1 and type, um, I believe that's type 2 storm, what they call type 2 storm bursting. And that occurs, once again, as this, this uh, big coronal mass ejection is continuing to travel to Earth. So if you take this timeline and you extend it out to days, you'll actually see that there's a lot of radio noise that continues out, oftentimes from the shock front that's being driven and that that's the type 2 burst is, is driven by the shock that typically is in front of these big solar storms. So they will continue to, to create type 2 noise all the way out to Earth. And let me show you some examples. So I'm going to stand on this side because you're not going to need this. This diagram on, on top of me is uh, one that has been, um, it's a very older, much older diagram, and it's actually kind of reversed from the one I just showed you because it goes from low frequency to high frequency, so it's flipped upside down. Again, I think historically that's just the way they, they did a lot of these. Um, but you can see here in this top panel, here's a type 3 burst. You can see, again, it's very high frequency. I'm trying to see what frequency they, in this case, it looks like they've only got it up at uh, about 100 megahertz. But you can see the type 3 coming down very, very quickly. Uh, it, it goes uh, from, from very high frequency to, or high frequency down to lower frequency as time goes on. Now, a type, the second panel shows a type 2, a type 3 burst, which is the very, very small type 3 burst, which is this right here. But then it also shows the type 2 bursts. See them here? And they branch out a bit. I'm trying to point to them. <laughs> yeah, this and this. Those are type 2 bursts, and that's due to the storm, uh, the shock front driving this thing. And then down here in the third panel, you get type 2 bursts. See those ones that kind of come down this way? And then you also get some type 4. See all that kind of noisy stuff down there? And all of that, see, all of these different types of radio bursts are indicating different types of phenomena as the CME is moving outward. And it's either because of the beams of electrons, type 3s, typically the beam, the electron beams that are shooting out from that, that magic region, that reconnection region that's shooting out, just like you had the beams going down or you had the beams going up. The type 3 is from the beams going up. Type 2 is from the shock front being driven as, as this big CME goes out into space. You've got a shock front that's being driven out. And then the type 4 is from this stuff coming as it continues to move out in, into the interplanetary medium. And that's why it's kind of like kind of nasty hash that just goes on for what seems to be forever. So to try to, oh, and I'm in the way, try to summarize that again a little bit for you. Let me stand on this side. I don't know if I can get far enough out, out of this picture. Um, but if you if you try if I try to take the whole picture, and say, okay, what does it look like on the sun? And I've tilted this image so that it, the sun is down at the bottom, and this eruption is going basically straight out. You can see the the frequency range. Um, if I can get to it right here, one to what is it? One to 10 gigahertz and then 500 megahertz and then 300 megahertz and then it continues to get lower and lower as you go out, 20 to 30 megahertz. And you can see uh, with the stuff that's shooting down, that's where you're going to get the highest frequency stuff. That's where you're going to get your microwave, right? That's this stuff up here. That's that stuff. And as you go, as you go higher, and now we're talking about above this, this, this magic region, if I can point to it, come on. 
point to the magic region. There's the magic region. Whoop, up higher. Right there. There's the magic region. That's where all the reconnection happens, and now everything above it is being released and going out. And as you go out, that's where you get the type 3 over here. Uh, sorry. Type 3 burst that goes straight down. Right? That's from those electron beams going out of the sun, okay, as that CME is launched. Then you get the type 2. Come on. No, no, no. Over here. The type 2 bursts that go down, and they branch oftentimes. That's from the driver, this, the shock coming out of this structure as it moves out. And I'll show you a better example of that in a second. But you have branching of the type 2 basically because of, fun, of harmonics. Um, you can get a fundamental and a harmonic, and it, I, I won't go into it because now you get into the physics of it. But you oftentimes will get branching. You can get branching of type 3s as well for the, some of the same reasons. And then as that, that, that monster continues to travel outward, that's when you start getting into this storm stuff. All this, the type 4 and the type 2 storm and all this other lower level stuff as you continue to get, once again, further away as you move further out in the atmosphere of the sun and out into interplanetary space. The frequency of, of radiation and the radio emission goes down and down and down. So let me pause here for a second to see if, if, any, if everybody's completely confused. <laughs> I'm going to turn on this computer and see if I can get any comments. Um, am I completely confusing you guys with this, or are we, are we making progress? I don't want to uh, um, you know, confuse everybody too much. Let's see. Oops, I'm trying to, let me see if I can reload this for a second. My, my, uh, my comments have stalled, so let me see. Okay. Um, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of comments that have nothing to do with what I'm talking about. <laughs> Brain waves. Anybody have a question about my course? <laughs> um, yes, brain, yes, brains work on frequencies, it's true, but um, that is a totally different course on that. We are, the funny thing is that we've actually, uh, we're actually trying to put together, and I'll stop for a second, we're actually trying to put together a database of uh, space weather impacts on, on humans because there's a lot of, there's a lot of research that is all over the place, and medical researchers are getting better at it, but they, they really haven't um, been able to put it all together yet. And so uh, it's, it's hard to find, it's, it's hard to not only find the data and collate it, but it's also hard to find and separate the, the, the good stuff from the chaff because the, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of research that's kind of not done all that well because they don't really understand space weather, and so they make very false assumptions and may, may do really good medical research, but they're making false assumptions about what's going on in our sun. And we have to separate that stuff because really, unfortunately, that means that the work that they did is not relevant or not probably, you know, reliable. But then there is a lot of good research that has been done with some credible uh, assumptions being made about some space weather events and, and the effects on people. And we, we're trying to, myself and, and some of my, my Patreon uh, VIPs, the steering committee, we're trying to kind of collate all that together to create a database and a set of resources so that people who are affected or feel that they're sensitive to certain aspects of space weather can at least get, at least be pointed in the right direction. Um, I think it's going to be decades yet before we get to a point where we can actually talk about this stuff realistically and get um, doctors to do really rigorous research uh, in a systematic fashion. But at least if we can start going in that direction, then we're going to be able to raise awareness about it because there are people who are susceptible. Uh, not just to space weather, but to electromagnetic radiation in general. And uh, as we continue to pump ourselves full of radio waves and, and pretty soon microwaves, especially with 5G networks coming online, there's going to be a lot more people who are going to get even more and more susceptible, and they're going to start having these really weird anomalies and mentally and, and you know, physically that they're not going to be able to explain. And, uh, and we, just did, we just need to start paying more attention to the health issues that, that uh, high energy radiation, you know, uh, causes. So that is coming. That is coming. So I just wanted to let you guys know that. Okay. Um, 
high frequency is microwave. What are the names for type 1, 2, 3, and 4? Um, you know, they'll fall, those, those frequencies fall in, in you know, in either uh, UHF, VHF, you know, they, there is, there is, and I, and I can show that to you. I've got a, a slide later that shows kind of where these, these gigahertz range or these ranges lie and really where we, um, you know, what we label them. Uh, typically, like the FCC labels them, and then what uh, what other types of technologies use those same frequency bands. And I hope I'm not taking too long to be able to get to that. Um, it would be interesting to see more work on biological space weather effects. Uh, while not the same, my great grandmother was quite deaf, but noticed improvement of her of her hearing during full moon. How how interesting. That's tidal. How uh, how how odd. I know a lot of people who get tinnitus when, uh, when geomagnetic storms hit. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are some people who will go check the space weather simply because their ears start ringing and they can't, and it doesn't go away. And sure enough, there'll be a geomagnetic storm. Tinnitus is one of the, the, um, one of the classic symptoms of people who are susceptible to electromagnetic disturbances. And, and it's, it, you know, like I said, it's, it's a very interesting field, and we just know very little about it as of yet. OK. Oh, yeah, someone just said tinnitus. <laughs> There you go. It's random, and I can't really tell what affects it. So there you go. You, you may be, you know, you just fell right into that classic issue. Um, there are a lot of people who have, who have tinnitus. If you have um, heavy metal poisoning, you know, if mercury poisoning or, lead, or even lead poisoning, or if you have, uh, or, you know, copper and chromium, or if you have um, uh, metal plates in your body from operations and surgeries, screws in your head, you know, hip replacements that are metal, pins, screws, stuff like that. Uh, your bones can ache uh, because of, of space weather effects, because of the electromagnetic field. There's all sorts of issues, and, and certain groups of people happen to be more susceptible than others. OK. Thank you for the tinnitus connection. Well, it might be. Yeah, OK. Yes, yeah, software-defined radio is a good way to check the HF spectrum. Yes, and I'll talk more about that in, the, in, the other, in another course. Um, I'll go into very specific effects. For example, there was, uh, back in 2006, a very famous uh, global GPS disruption of, you know, of signals when a very large solar flare screamed, when the sun screamed very loudly. And again, people don't, don't necessarily pay attention to the fact that solar flares really can take out uh, large swaths of GPS. And again, another thing, yeah, uh, when we have these constellations, and they're serving internet to, you know, what, half of the globe. Um, we're going to be in for some really serious wake-up calls when internet is down suddenly. Anybody who has satellite-provided internet, it's going to be down, and it'll be down for half a day, maybe more. Um, and it'll be down because of the solar flare hits, and then it'll be down again when the big CME hits and causes all the satellites to kind of lose their altitude and lose their, connect their connectivity to each other. Um, we are going to be in for some rude awakenings with, with space weather here in the next decade. Uh, I'm absolutely sure of it. And hopefully it's not going to be catastrophic. It's going to be something that just get, wakes us up and says, okay, yeah, space weather is real. We've got to take, we got to really start thinking about this now, especially as we launch 12,000 satellites into the LEO constellation. It's just kind of crazy without any understanding of how it's actually going to happen. Okay, hopefully I, I answered some of your questions. Um, and I'm trying to think how much more of this do I want to show you guys, because I've been, this has already been an hour and a half. Um, one thing I guess, I guess I can quickly talk about, because I'm getting close to the end, but one thing I can talk about is why do radio bursts uh, drift over time? I think I kind of covered this uh, to a great degree, but let's talk about a type one, or I mean type three burst. Whoops, let me stand on this side. Uh, here's the type three burst down here at the bottom. You can see it in this plot. And really, you can see as, it, as the frequency goes down, if I, if I try to find it here, as the frequency goes down over time, down like this, the reason why, whoops, I went too far down, but the reason why the frequency goes down over time is really as we look at this little diagram of the sun, uh, and you have the, uh, again, the same kind of thing where you have at high, closer to the sun, the magnetic field is stronger, so therefore you have higher uh, frequency radio noise, and as you move outward from the sun, that radio noise drops. So if you can imagine a big solar storm being launched, because now we're talking about type 3, we're talking about 
the types that are driven from something leaving the sun. That beam is leaving the sun, and as it leaves the sun, it'll start out at high uh, frequency radio noise, the radio burst sound, and then as it travels out, it will begin to drop. So what that causes is something that looks like what we call a dispersion in, in frequency, but it's really not necessarily that. It's just the, the result of a, an electron beam, in this case, moving outward from the sun, and as it moves outward from the sun, it's still generating the same kind of radio noise, but because the magnetic field strength of the sun is dropping as it leaves, as it goes further away from the sun, the frequency of noise it's going to be able to create, or it's going to be able to scream, is going to drop. And so that's what you see with these type 3 and type 2. You see it all with a lot of these different types of, of radio bursts that actually have like a continuum go or that, are, that are at least a kind of a, a stripe going down. Let me show, um, here's an example. Let's see, if, which side do I stand on? I'll stand on this side and I'll hit here. You can see the type 3 beams. Now this is inverted and, and again I might not, I may take this slide out just simply because the, the, the frequency spectrum here is inverted. You have the high frequencies up at the top, I mean down here at the bottom, and the low frequencies up at the top. So I'll flip it upside down. But you go from high frequencies down to lower frequencies in these type 3 beams. And in the type 2, you see the little beams going, let's see if I can draw these down here. There's the type 2 beams and you see them going kind of up this way, right? Again, that's the same kind of thing. If something is leaving the sun, you're going to see things go from high frequency to low frequency. And remember, again, this, this plot is reversed, so I probably won't show it next time. Uh, and you know what, before I get to that, let me, let me show you uh, type 2 bursts. Let me show you this one, because this is really important. Um, this is a plot, and I always liked this, because it shows, uh, it, it, it was some really good studies done by Jens um, who is one of my SE teammates, actually. He did it a while back. And then also in Zimrovitz um, in 2012. But they had...
You guys hear me at all? Do you guys hear me? I think my batteries died. That's what all those things were. How long did it happen? Oh, the last 15 minutes. Man, this has just been, today has been a technical nightmare for me. Ah, oh, okay. So I'm holding this in my hand. Wow, 15 minutes. I'm going to go back to, and I'm not going to, I won't redo the, the talk today because I'm actually losing my voice, but I'm going to go back to 15 minutes might have been this slide. What slide was I at, guys? And I see my, my I think my, my sound is still working. Am I correct? Let me see. Is my sound still working right now? My yeah. Okay, so what slide was I at? I went back to this, uh, this slide here thinking that this might be this one here. This might be the slide where I lost sound. So I know, because I'll pick up on the next course, I'll pick up where, I, where my sound went out. This is so depressing. Um, miss a lot of good lecture 17 minutes ago exactly where what slide was it guys was it this was it this slide with the with the radio bursts over time was it further back can you guys even remember or do i just need to wait slide 28 what slide is this six seven eight okay so i was about the right place okay so that gives me an idea here, I'm going to mute this. Well, I'm going to turn this down if I can. Hold on, because I'm hearing myself echo. Um, that gives me an idea of how bad it is, how much I lost. Right. Oh, and all the Type 2 stuff at the radio burst there and at the end. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. Um, yeah, I won't keep you longer, but I will... Oh, <laughs> I'm trying to think how I can finish this for you. Um, what I'm trying to, what I'm thinking of, okay, so what this is here, and I'm now watching my audio like a hawk. What this is here is this was what I was going to be covering in the next talk. In, but what I'll do is I'll go and do a bit of a review in my next um, uh, mini course. So I'll catch up, and it's actually a good place too, because, well, I won't flip back because I'm flipping so much. But there's one slide where I showed um, a, a very busy chart. Actually, I will flip back to it for a second. This one. I'll pick up, I'll pick up kind of right about here because um, this, is, this particular plot shows a, a coronal mass ejection from basically a, a, a source point at the flare in the CME where it was launched all the way to Earth. See, if I get on this side, so it goes from the, from the sun all the way to Earth. And, and you can see that there's a lot of radio emission all the way. So what I'll do is I'll, talk, I'll pick up there, and I'll, because that's what I plan to talk about in the next uh, course anyway when it comes to flare dynamics. So I will talk about that, and at that time I'll go into the driver. This is what type 2 bursts are. Is they're associated with big coronal mass ejections. So I can pick that up and add that to, um, to this. So if my plot, if my audio is still working, let me check. Yeah, I think my audio is still working. Um, this was my closing slide that said this is just the beginning. And I, what I was going to really go into in the next talk was going to be flare dynamics, talking about the precursor and the impulsive and extended phases of the flares. Also things like the gra a gradual flare versus an impulsive one. Essentially a gradual flare is one that has a coronal mass ejection launch where an impulsive flare doesn't. And when I go into that stuff, that's where I will catch back up and review some of this radio burst stuff so that you get the details. So I, I don't think, we're, I'll just make sure I add that to the next one so that you won't have missed anything, even with 17 minutes of no audio. I'm so sorry. Anyway, um, on top of that, I'll talk about the solar flare myth. Uh, this was due to my, my 
one of my advisors, uh, the late Jack Gosling, he wrote a landmark paper back in 1993 about solar flares and the fact that coronal mass ejections don't need solar flares to happen. Um, and at the time, even space weather physicists believed that. So even space weather physicists get solar flares and, and coronal mass ejections mixed up. So don't feel badly if you've done it in the past or if you see weather people do it you know, on the news or something. They say, oh, a solar flare is racing towards Earth. And no, <laughs> the solar flare has already hit. It's the solar storm. It's the CME that's coming towards Earth. Um, but because space weather physicists actually have done the same thing. And it took Jack, part of what Jack Gosling did to um, to really set people straight. And then I will talk about the fav my favorite part of the next uh, course will be talking about the actual disruptions. We had my audio went off again, didn't it? My battery's dying. So we'll see how long it lasts. Anyway. Um, I'll talk about the effects of solar radio emission at Earth, and I'll give multiple uh, examples of it. That will be the December event. Yeah, this is really dying. As well as a couple other events. So I will Those of you who want to stick around and, and ask questions, I will be here. But right now, I have to change the batteries. But right now, the course is officially Am I here? Yay, I got new batteries. OK, so for those of you who want to stick around, uh, I, will ask, I will answer some questions. And, uh, and one thing I didn't get a chance to show you was there was one question I did get uh, early on. One of my Patreon followers had asked me about whether or not it was possible to hear Jovian uh, emission from you know just here at earth and in actuality yes it is so this this is a, a plot there I mean a, a, a chart that is directly related to that I just wanted people to know that yes you can hear Jovian the Jupiter its system is extremely loud and I can do a course on planetary radio emission but this is a very exciting area in in radio astronomy simply because um, they're beginning to use it to try to see if they can find exoplanets and I think it's a fascinating area of study. Uh, and it's once again where space weather and radio astronomy kind of collide. So there's the Jovian system is extremely complicated. And this is just a little bit of what the Jovian system looks like. The reason why it's symmetric is because you know the Jovian system is spinning round and round and round. And it sits out like this because of what we call the Eo Taurus. This is um, all the dust from Eo's volcanoes. It kind of sits and accretes into this disk, almost like rings, because uh, Jupiter has them from mainly from Eo. And um, there's a lot of radio noise that goes on, uh, and it's a very it's just a very complicated system. So I won't go into the details, but I can in a later course if people want me to kind of step away from Earth for a minute and talk about some of the other planets and the types of emissions we get from these planets, and whether or not they actually are, you know visible or audio, you know, whether you can hear them or not at Earth. So, so that's that. So let me see if I got questions here. <clears throat> okay. A lot of great data. Don't know where to start. <laughs> uh, you know, would be a light that shows the audio level. Yeah. Well, I've got an audio feed here. But remember, I'm a one woman show. And I'm trying to look at you and talk to you and look at the charts and point to things. So I'm more interested in looking at how 
I'm performing and I don't have somebody to monitor the audio. So, you know, until I become like a big space weather rock star and can have a team of people that can help me, this is kind of the, you know, the guerrilla warfare way it's got to happen. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I do all the tech for myself. I always have. And, um, you know, I used to run a recording studio. And so, you know, I'm used to doing this stuff, but I don't have a team right now that can help me. I hope I can eventually, but right now this is about it. So, again, sorry for the for making you guys be guinea pigs. Agreed. Saturn is creepy. <laughs> what am I hearing when a car radio is a shh sound? Well, that depends. I mean, that's interference or or nothing. That you're talking about just the static. Uh, that's probably an, an automatic gain uh, uh, converter that that is actually creating your gain control that's actually boosting the, the gain all the way up so the quiet white noise that you would hear when you don't get a signal suddenly becomes very loud. So you're actually hearing it just increase because it's searching for a signal and it's trying to boost the, the audio that or the sound that it is getting and it's really just getting white noise. Um, you should be a big weather space tech. <laughs> yeah, I'd be nice. Uh, let's see, Tamitha, what's happening Friday evening? Uh, the 7 megahertz that had propagation openings that were amazing. Oh, yeah. You know, I was having some very fun conversations just yesterday. Uh, I gave a talk at the Hamcom. It was a virtual talk just like this. And when I gave the talk, uh, people were, we, we had kind of a little bit of a conversation afterwards, especially about not, not just the fact that we're having sporadic E openings right now because we're coming into summer. But the sporadic E, I mean, it's the amount of propagation that people are getting right now is just over the top. And the funny thing is that noctilucent clouds right now are also over the top. People just last night were seeing them in, like, Michigan. People are seeing them in Germany. They're seeing them at lower and lower latitudes that they've never seen them before. And those in the know, they know that noctilucent clouds are created by cosmic ray showers. Uh, it gives little nucleation sites for the water vapor to, to adhere to, so it creates these really cool cloud formations that are, you know, unique to that type of, of phenomenon. But one thing that I find very interesting is that as you increase the amount of cosmic ray penetration at Earth, because we're at solar minimum, and we're, because our solar minimums are so low, that's increasing the cosmic ray penetration even more. What that means is that it's creating more electrons and more charged particles in the ionosphere, just like it's creating more noctilucent clouds, right? So what's happening, I believe, is that we're getting a boost in radio propagation, uh, even above and beyond typical sporadic E and tropospheric ducting, simply because our cosmic ray flux is so incredibly large right now. And you know what? In these low activity cycles, this may be the norm. So, you know what? Solar minimum may be a bummer when it comes to solar flux for amateur radio propagation, but it may be a boon when it comes to cosmic ray flux. So, you know, you take the good with the bad, right? Okay, let's see. Thanks for the tape bit on the Noctilucent Cloud. You're, well, you're welcome. Self-teching it shows style, baby. Thank you. <laughs> it's the best I can do. <laughs> I appreciate somebody who appreciates a tech, tech head like me. Okay, let's see. I really think, I'll say it again, I really think you can do this and believe in you go for NASA and you can do this from space aboard ISS one day. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm kind of the same as David Bowie's saying. He says, I sing about space so that I don't have to go there. <laughs> I think that's a really good philosophy. I'm... When I was younger, I wanted to be an astronaut, but the more I've learned about space weather, the less I really want to be in it. <laughs> Especially the radiation part. That's just not something that thrills me as much as it used to. Um, so I've made the joke about Neil deGrasse Tyson who wants to go to Mars, and I'm just like, have at it, man, go. But I'm not gonna join you there. Just because Right now, I just don't think we have the technology that can keep us as safe as we need to be, especially for long-duration flights. But I do think that we can have a good time with, um, with Aurora tourism and even what I've called Hotel ISS. I don't know if you guys have seen the news recently, 
but they're talking about, you know, NASA's now going to, I, I forget how much, like $40,000 a day or something like this. You can actually go um, stay at the ho at Hotel ISS for a night, right? I still call it Hotel ISS. I can't help it. Uh, but they're renting out this, this space. And I think that's fantastic for people who want to take the ticket to get up there and, you know, Virgin Galactic or SpaceX and dock at the ISS and then stay in whatever you know, side compartment they have set up for you. The problem with that, though, and this is one of the reasons why space weather is going to become so incredibly important very soon, if not right now. Uh, and actually, let me, let me retract that. It is important right now. And if anything, we're almost behind the curve. And, and I'm doing, this community is doing an immense amount at raising awareness. And I'm so incredibly grateful for all of you because you do this. But we, we still kind of are falling behind the curve because companies like Space, SpaceX and, and um, uh, Virgin Galactic and, and Worldview, they're just moving so quickly. And tourism is happening, space tourism is happening so fast that now if NASA is going to rent rooms in the ISS, the first question that comes to my mind is, will the person... Will the, will the, what they call private astronauts, will the private astronauts be granted the same access to the bulkhead where the, the NASA astronauts stay and get underneath all the water, uh, all the water storage that they have in the center of the ISS when there is a geomagnetic storm and a big solar storm or a, a, a big radiation storm happening? If the private astronauts are not allowed to walk through or glide through whatever control rooms they need to go through to get to the center of the ISS and get into that safe space, then they're going to be out there taking radiation dose like nobody's business while the NASA astronauts are going to be tucked in a safe little crib underneath this big water lake of water that's protecting them. And I bet you no one's even thought to ask that question. You know, they, there were a couple uh, radiation bursts, radiation storms that happened back in the Apollo era. And luckily, none of the astronauts were on the moon at the time when it happened or doing EVAs or anything else like that when these, these big events occurred. But there has been some forensics done on these events, and it was shown that these astronauts would have gotten lethal doses of radiation had they been out in the open at the time. I mean, what can I say, right? We are being so incredibly cavalier, and we're not answering the questions that need to be answered, and, and, and we're not demanding that the commercial side of aurora tourism or, or space adventures, space exploration, is being taken as seriously as what NASA knows we need to. Because not that it's NASA's fault. NASA's taking care of its own. But the commercial world needs to take care of their own. And really, I don't think there's any malfeasance here. There's no, there's no malevolence here. It's simply a lack of awareness. I mean, even, even Alan Eustace, who went up into the, the big you know, worldview balloon and did the, has the, holds the world record for the highest uh, free fall. Uh, he even beat you know, Felix Baumgartner in the Red Bull jump. Alan Eustace went higher. He went to 135,000 feet and jumped out. Um, and, and skydived all the way down. And so he saw the rim of space and the whole thing. I mean, he's going higher than even a lot of Aurora tourism balloons will go. They're only going to go to 110,000, and he went to 135, I believe. And I asked him, because I met him, I said, uh, you know, did you check the space weather that day? And he freaked out. I mean, he literally got pale. And he freaked out and said, no, should I have? And I just, you know, I teased him. I said, no, it was okay. I said, I, ch I checked for him, and it was fine. But had it not been, you know, these people don't even take this stuff into consideration. And it's, again, it's not a level of, of malevolence. It's just a lack of understanding that, that this stuff is important. And it could be, because radiation is invisible, they don't realize that they're taking their lives in their own hands when they do this. So this is something that we, as a community, really need to up the ante and, and get them to understand that this is weather. 
And, you know, just like you don't go out in a hurricane, you don't go out when there's a radiation storm. It's just that simple. So, anyway, I'll, that's my rant. <laughs> okay, yeah, very practical look at safe, space safety. I, yeah, you know, it, it really is. Safety first. And, and we're, we're getting this stuff that's... that's the, the advancements that are being made are so incredibly fast that we're having a hard time keeping up with them. So, you know, this fall I start teaching at Millersville University. I'm going to start teaching weather broadcasters. And hopefully we'll get practitioners in the field that are going to be, you know, station scientists and TV broadcasters and people in your local communities, your local news communities, who have the credentials they need to be able to get on television and talk about this stuff. And they'll start breaking through this, this lack of awareness. And along with me continuing to do, to push, you know, push the envelope, and then having these other people who are credentialed going out and, and trying to get it on the nightly news, especially when it's warranted, I think we'll get there. I just hope we're going to get there fast enough. So, okay. Uh, let's see, anything else, guys? Can noctilucent clouds be used like meteor trails for radio propagation? Um, mm. I don't think so because, you know, the noctilucent clouds are being formed in the neutral atmosphere. And really when we're talking about radio propagation, we're talking about higher up. And so the, they're, the neutral winds that drive, you know, terrestrial weather, they're very different than the winds, there are winds, that are being, uh, that are higher in the, in the upper atmosphere, in the ionosphere, that are driving, you know, currents and things up, up higher. And in those higher regions, that's where we're dealing with the different types of propagation and wave guides and, and um, skip and all that kind of stuff. So while noctilucent clouds might give you an idea of the latitude where propagation is possible, I don't think it's going to be a one-for-one one in terms of how it moves or the exact lo location of it. But it could give you a general sense because if you know if the cosmic ray penetration is at a latitude low enough to give you noctilucent clouds, then up above it, it's definitely increasing the, the um, propagation capability of the ionosphere. It's just the details will be different because the regimes are different. Hopefully that answers that question. Okay. Um, love your rants. They're objective and real. Oh, yeah. I think, you know, you guys are just so amazing. As a community, I, I couldn't ask for more. Your comments on YouTube, your comments on Twitter and Facebook, you guys put up with me, <laughs> you know. I, I'm just me, and and yeah, I rant and I I apologize, but you guys stick up for me, and I just really sometimes it brings me to tears. I'll just feel so, I just feel so blessed to have such a supportive community around. Um, and you understand the passion. You understand that we're trying to do this for good. We're trying to keep people safe, and and we're not. It, it's not about making money, and it's not about being sensational, and it's not about you know scaring people. It's about being real and, and turning space weather into the kind of weather that, that people can understand and grasp. And so thank you for everything you do to help that process along. And thank you for putting up with me, especially thank you for putting up with me. All right, let's see if I have any other questions. Um, I'm going to probably go to Patreon here in a second and see if I have other questions too. Um, let's see. Anyone give me a question on Patreon? Thanks, Tamitha, for going into the different types of radio bursts. Already explained a lot to me. Oh, good. Yeah, you lost audio. I know. Okay, yes. So, yes, Andreas, I will. If you're still with us, Andreas, I will. I will pick up at slide 28. I, I've already got an idea of how to kind of incorporate that in the next course. So uh, I will definitely do that. And I'm so sorry, again, that I dropped audio. That was just awful. Uh, I need to find a way to kind of... Well, let me ask you a question. Do you guys hear my little echo of audio? I'm going to say again. Do you, do you hear my echo? Yes or no? Because if you guys don't hear that in my microphone, then I might just keep the audio on and just get used to it. It's kind of yelling at me. <laughs> oh, thank you, guys. I appreciate that. So, no echo. Really? Oh, that's great. 
because I think it would be a lot easier for me in the future to, uh, to hear if my audio goes out. If I suddenly don't have an echo anymore, then I'll know my audio, something's wrong with my audio. I think I can train myself to ignore it, as long as you guys don't hear it. Nothing? Someone said yes, no echo, no echo. Most people don't hear it. Uh, Sukori interpretation, did you hear the echo? And Okay, so Sukori hears it. Maybe I can turn it down. Maybe I can muffle it a little bit or put it further away. Hold on. What about now? Do you hear the echo now? It sounds almost as loud. I'll figure that out. But most people, I can slightly hear it. So some people can slightly hear it. And no one hears not enough to matter. Okay, you know, just a little, I think I made it worse actually by putting it there. I'll figure out what to do so that I hear it, because it doesn't have to be as loud as I hear it. I mean, it's pretty loud. So I can figure out what to do, keep it lower, and then maybe I can just kind of relate to that. And as long as I hear my own echo, but you guys don't, then that will be my mitigation for <laughs> 17 minutes of no audio. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, guys. So there's a, there's a fix. Okay, talk back. Monitor out of phase to cancel. I don't have, I love you, but I don't have the capability of doing that with this thing. No, I don't. It's not that sophisticated a mixer. I know, I need, a, I need a phase button. Wouldn't that be great? No, someone's very savvy. They, they, either that's an amateur radio operator or an audio guy, and I know exactly what you mean, and I can't. If I had an audio deck, I'd be able to do it, but I don't. Let me stick it down there and see if that makes it better. Yeah, see, that's almost too quiet for me now. But okay, anyway, so you're so cute. Okay, good. I'm glad you guys are putting up with me. Um... I, I'm deaf in one ear and can't get the gear out of the other. <laughs> I love it. Okay. No, I'm not hearing streaming. Well, I'm hearing a streaming latency. You're right. But I'm hearing a streaming latency from my controller. Um, I wonder if I can show this to you. Do you see my controller? That's my controller. I'm using something called Slingbox, or Sling Studio, rather. And that's what's allowing me to do the green screen. And you can see my audio feed right there into a set of headphones. And it's a two-second delay coming out of the controller. Now, you want to make it worse, because I do streaming for, other, for my husband at his theater. It's a two-second delay coming out of this. And then if I monitor it on, my, on a YouTube channel, it's like another seven seconds. So I can conceivably have like three sets of audio echoing multiple times, a multi-tap kind of delay. And it, it becomes very irritating. But uh, this little rig here doesn't doesn't have the capability of doing the the phase inversion which really bums me out because that, that would have been a great solution uh, maybe a Bluetooth or an earplug I don't know if I can do that with this system um, but yeah I, an in-ear monitor would be better and, and I've thought of that as well but I might have to have a cord because I don't think this system would it doesn't connect with a Bluetooth there's a Bluetooth on the iPad but I don't know if I can route it through there. I can try. I can, I can take a look. Anyway, guys, okay, thank you so much for your patience and your time and helping me try to work out some of the technical issues for future, um, future mini courses. And yes, be sure to catch the next mini course because I will pick up from where the audio dropped off on slide 28 and uh, add all that back in. And I think it's going to work out just fine with, with the course material I have in mind. And then the next course, by the way, on Flare Dynamics, we'll have a lot more eye candy. So you'll be able to see the flares in action. And what's cool will be this time I can put up some of the radio burst information and put up the model again. And you can see as the flare is happening, what part of, you know, oh, that's where the microwave emission happens. Oh, there's the hard x-rays. Oh, there's the when the type three burst is launched. You know, and, you, and you'll really be able to sink in as to what parts of the flare are generating what kind of radio noise. And I think it will really make you feel kind of warm and fuzzy when it comes to looking at flares and understanding how they help the sun scream. Okay. 
And then, of course, we'll talk about the effects. So if that's it for questions, um, I think I'll say goodbye. I'll check one more time for questions. Anyone else? Any last second things? Or put the chat in front of you and we'll let you know. You know, I did that one, I, I used to do that. Do you remember when I had it, it, the back, the screen behind me, I'd flip to a version of, of YouTube? <laughs> and I'd have that behind me because I only have one computer here that I can access that, that the chat window, because I, I don't have a lot of computers I can put right next to me. And so I did that, but everybody thought it was like psychedelic and stuff because they'd see me behind me. And it would be like this infinite mirror thing. Um, so I stopped doing that and I started putting it over here, but now I can't see the chat nearly as well. So I fix one problem and I create another. <laughs> it never ends. Oh, okay. Flare dynamics. Can't wait. Good, good, good. Um, oh, that's sweet. Yes, my husband is, is very grateful. Uh, he's very grateful to have me because I'm the only one who's a techie in the house. If, if it weren't for me, we wouldn't even have a VCR that worked. <laughs> We don't even have cable TV with a remote control. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm the techie. Anyway, okay, guys, it looks like I answered all your questions for now. And uh, this has been great. And, again, thank you so much for putting up with me and, and all my issues. So hopefully next time we'll get it fixed. And I can't wait for the next uh, flare course. It's going to be a good one. Okay? All right, guys, talk to you soon. Okay, bye.